Nestled deep in the heart of the Tennessee mountains, a remarkable couple has turned their passion for mushrooms into a thriving venture. Tonight, we explore the story of Kimberly King and her man Mayhem, true pioneers in the world of mushroom cultivation. Nestled in the picturesque landscapes of Tennessee, their farm not only produces an exquisite variety of mushrooms, but also serves as a nurturing ground for a community of new cultivators connected through the virtual realm of Facebook. Join us as we unravel the secrets behind their success, the challenges they've overcome, and the fascinating connections they've forged in the world of fungi. Get ready to be inspired and discover the magical world of mushrooms in this episode filled with growth, innovation, and the shared spirit of cultivating dreams. You're listening to the Mike O'Geeky Podcast. A podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator, advocate, and educator. Every week, he sits down with fellow cultivators, mushroom educators, scientists, and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives. All right, guys, what's up? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Myco Geeky, and we have a wonderful show for you tonight. We're going to sit down with a uh, uh, couple Facebook gurus, a couple guys have been around for a while. Um, I've had multiple people reach out and say, hey, have you ever thought about having these guys on? And, you know, there's always a tipping point for me. And uh, we reached it, and here we are. So we're going to talk to the one and only Kimberly King. Um, if, if you've been growing cubes and you're around Facebook, you probably know who she is, along with her, uh, her, her guy Friday, uh, Mayhem. Uh, those two got some stories. Man, we probably have to have these guys back on again. Uh, they, they, they told some wonderful stories. I cannot wait to get into it and let you guys hear, hear some of these these just really cool stories, man. Um, but before we do that, let's go ahead and shout out. Got to shout out the people who are taking care of me. My Patreon supporters are absolutely taking care of me right now. I love you guys. Uh, I, I, I really cannot tell you how much it means that you guys see value in what I'm doing every week and you look forward to it and you go, I want to help this guy out. This guy's just a guy in a basement trying to put together a show that we rely on, and uh, it really means a lot to me. So, so thank you, each and every one of you guys, for your continued support. Um, I want to hit our mission statement, right? Just I'm always trying to stay on track, so let's do it. Why I am here. I want to help educate and inspire mushroom cultivators and enthusiasts on the art and science of mushroom cultivation while delving into the medicinal, therapeutic, and societal aspects of mushrooms, including discussions on integration therapy, spirituality, and the decriminalization movement. We are definitely, uh, you know, we're an interesting little, little population. We're, we're, we're working under interesting parameters. Uh, we are fighting for our right to take care of ourselves. Um, we, we touch on a little bit of this tonight uh, when I talk with uh, Kimberly and Mayhem. And I just want to reiterate it here up at the top. It's it's uh, it's important. It's also very unique. Um, so you know, I think I mentioned not too long ago, my my buddy Spuds on my uh, my Discord. He reached out. He's like, you know, I'm I'm a blacksmith. Um, I, I make everything by hand from raw materials. He likes to find things. So like, none of the stuff that he he's doing is bought. This is all sourced by himself every bit of this is handmade again i just want to show you guys this amazing knife this knife is so bad so badass let me see i gotta get my let's just see if we can catch the shine of that light a little bit there okay i mean do you guys see what i'm seeing this is a uh, hand hammered damascus steel what that means is for for those of you who are not you know, I ain't a blacksmith, but I, I I looked it up. I know a little bit about it. He is taking different layers of different, usually different uh, hardness steels and, and folding them and continuing to fold them in, in on themselves over and over again. 
so that you get these these layers of steel and the idea is that it's supposed to hold hold a really nice edge so he sent me one of these and this was just him going hey man i love your podcast i love i love this discord i i love what it's teaching me about mu growing mushrooms uh, i want to do something to to show you my appreciation so could i make a knife for you and i said well if you're going to make me a knife make me a forging knife well, of course, that was not the kind of knives he was used to making. So he had to figure out how to add the, you know, the little bristles on the end. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of an interesting shape for a foraging knife. But he stepped up to the plate. He did it. And, uh, and I loved it. And I kept going on and on about it. And he's like, well, let me send you some to give away on the, on the, the Discord. And so he sent me a few more knives. And I got these things. And I'm like, I cannot give these things away. You, 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 I mean, I was like, how many hours do you spend making these things? He's like 20, 25 hours. So he, he sent me three knives and, uh, I would, I would love to offer them for sale. I think this guy is a stellar craftsman. I think he deserves to, um, you know, get paid for his hard work. I'm going to just show you a couple of these things. So, so here's the first one. Let me see if I can get that. Do you see that Damascus? Do you see the dimpling on on that little shroud there. I mean, this is a gorgeous knife, guys. This is lovely. So if you guys like to forage or or if you just want to support my buddy Spuds here, um, get at me. Uh, I'll be selling these knives. Uh, they are, I'm going to make them very affordably priced. Um, I don't really want to get into exactly what I'm going to charge uh, on air, but let me just show you a few of these. So here's another one. This handle is pretty awesome. And as you can tell, each blade has a different Damascus pattern because each one, you know, is hammered individually. So let me show you this last one here real quick. Oh, try to get it out of the sheath here without cutting myself. These things are sharp, I'm going to tell you right now. Um, see if cover my cover my eyes. Try to get this thing in focus. There we go. All right. Again, some more dimpling. So anyway, uh, you know, I'm, I don't usually don't pander to my audience here for this kind of stuff, but this is not for me. This is for my buddy. He is, uh, he's a retired vet. He's on a fixed income. And uh, the thought of me just giving away his knives to help promote my Discord did not feel right. So I just, I want to take a couple minutes here on the show. If anybody likes knives, um, Man, if you guys like like knives even a quarter as much as I like mushrooms, or I know a lot of you guys do, I'm sure there are some people out there that wouldn't mind getting their hand on hands on one of these knives. Just get at me, and, and, and we'll, we'll get one to you. So, again, Spuds, thank you so much. Uh, I, I I really look forward to sending you some some money here for all your hard work. I I really uh, I look forward to the spring and summer using my knife. I'm, dude, I'm just like sitting here in the lab sometimes just pulling this knife out, thinking about what mushrooms I'm going to be slicing up and, and dicing up this spring. So thank you once again. All right. So we, uh, this is what we do here, right? We, we find interesting people and we sit down and we get to know them. And I'm going to tell you right now, these two, these two are fascinating. I, I'm like, I'm ready to drive down to Tennessee and hang out with these guys. They, because I know they got stories upon stories upon stories. Without further ado, let's welcome to the show the one and only Mike O'Power couple, uh, rocking Facebook left and right all day long, Kimberly King and Mayhem. What's up, guys? Hey, how are you doing? Hello. All right. So, uh, Th this is pre-recorded. I'm gonna let everybody know these guys. These guys are, you know, they wake up at the crack of dawn. They got they got geeky up real early, earlier than my kids. We're getting all ready for this and doing this. So, I I I'm really excited. It definitely says a lot about you guys. I'm glad we're remotely close in time zones. Sometimes I'm dealing with Pacific uh, Standard Time people, and and that gets to be a whole nother uh, ball of wax. So great to have you guys here. Um, Let's do this. First, I just want to let everybody know that, uh, you know, from time to time, people will message me and say, you should have so-and-so on. You should have so-and-so on. So, um, 
that that's how this happens. So if you're out there watching, uh, watching the show every Monday and there's somebody you really like or somebody you're like, you know, I think I, I want to know more about this person. Toss me a, a DM, let me know, and, and I I will pursue it. And and you never know, you might have a a guest on the on the show. So I these guys came very highly recommended by multiple people, and uh, we finally put it together. So uh, so glad to have you guys here. Glad to be here. Really honored to be even asked. <laughs> I mean, you well, you guys have been around for a hot minute, so you know sooner or later. This is what I say. Sometimes people are like, "Oh, I'm so so happy to be on," and I'm like. You've been around before me. You were here doing this, so it's only a matter of time. I mean, I'm one guy, so it takes me a minute to get to everybody. It's a big community. So anyway, let's do this like we always do. First mushroom memory. I I, I want you both to go back and uh, think about like how mushrooms really entered your life, how, how you, you know, how they get you. Well... I'll tell you mine first. Mayhem has a lot. He's got a really cool story. But for me, the experience was just, it wasn't with cultivating or anything at first. It was, shoot, in the 90s. I, Hey, what can I say? I love to rave. And, you know, I had my little scene with my little rave people, you know, and we, we did this thing. It was called candy flipping. You know, and um, I remember it was quite a different experience with the mushrooms that way that, that behooved me to want to do it on its own. And I remember that experience. I was sitting with um, a date at the time and and it was. Wow. He, he I had a bag of Sharpies. I mean, every color you could think of. And I just began just, I don't know, my inner creativity, everything about just, oh, this feels so great, you know, started happening. And I mean, it was a good four hours. I sat there on his back with some Sharpies and colored pens and just, it looked like a Monet picture. I kid you not. It was just everything blended. You know, I had a big Amanita muscaria mushroom in the middle of his back, you know, and I, before this, I hadn't really you know, mind you had an experience with mushrooms. So all of this brought all this together forward for me. And it was like, you know, and then later on, you know, it brought all these euphoric feelings and happiness and tapped into good spaces and areas that I hadn't really thought about before, you know. And so I didn't do it often, but I do remember those experiences in the 90s. And that kind of brought me, you fast forward into Later on, I re that's what got me into the cultivating part of it and ha what helped me become, you know, off of pills and things was I remember the happiness and experience I had with the mushrooms. And I, I, I did not want to be linked to big pharma. I did not want, you know, antidepressants and their happy pills or whatever you want to call it, because I was not happy. I was not anything, you know? And so for me, I needed that serotonin and everything, obviously. And I started thinking of the mushrooms I used to do and how, God, how elevated I was for one thing, you know, it wasn't really even about the trippy or anything at this point. Cause I mean, I'm, 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 I'm in my fifties now. <laughs> so, you know, even though we grow a lot, we don't, we don't, you know, take a lot of them, but at that point in time, yes, and that began my, once it helped me with my, my, once taking a mushroom trip again for my reset, for my mindset, for getting, I was, a, I had a horrible wreck, okay, in 2007. I broke my neck in three places and my vertebrae right in the middle, T7 and T6, and between my shoulder blades. Before that, I had no experience of pain pills or anything whatsoever. And boy, during that time, I had I had a lot going on. You know, I had all that stuff, six ribs broken, the whole nine yards. I was in Erlanger. I was life flighted. So obviously, I got put on a regimen of pain pills, you know. And before that, I knew nothing. I've always been just a weed-smoking person. Even, 
after all those crazy days were over, you know, you fast forward into the mid 2000s, that's what I did. You know, I, I just smoked my weed. So I, um, I got addicted to pills, you know, obviously. And it, it's, not, it's not hard to do. Not hard. No. To do. Especially if you're no. in a lot of pain and you get the big old bottle of pills and That's... your body just, you know, when you need, even when you need it for a duration of time, it's really hard to go. At what point should I not be on these anymore? And you just keep running through them. And then the next thing you know, there you are. Well, see, the thing about it is, too, uh, you know, there's so much into that whole op opioid thing, okay? And at the time, now we're talking 2007, you know, so we fast, you know, I mean, rewind a little bit. But these doctors, if you've got the injuries that I had, the medical records to back it up, the whole nine yards, you know, they don't even monitor it. They hand you things and then it causes you to build up a tolerance, you know, and you and 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 your body needs it and and you just want more and more, you know. And so it it, it gets your body addicted to it when you when in realistically you can wean yourself off. And so doing all of these things, quitting all my pharmaceuticals kind of, I don't recommend it for everybody to do it the way I did it. But I did just kind of quit cold turkey and stick to weed. But the thing was, I withdrew a lot more off of medications like my Zoloft and my psych, you know, those type things. Those gave me a nasty withdrawal, you know, a, a lot worse than the uh, uh, opioids. And and that's what thing people don't realize. Just because it's not, you know, an opioid does not mean that your body is not absorbing these chemicals. And, and after a while, for me, it was 20 some odd years. I was, you know, so I, I did not only just quit opioids, I quit everything and just switched to weed. And, 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 and to keep myself from sinking into a deep depression, I started, you can buy these over the counter. They're just five HTP pills. And I reflected back on those rave days because that's what I used to take to get myself out of the depression then. So I compensated with these, with the 5-HTP. You can buy them over the counter at Walgreens, you know, or where you get vitamin C or anything. It's just a supplement. And I would take those alongside with just smoking my weed and it got me off my pain and it got me off of dropping serotonin after needing my Zoloft. And then, you know, I became at a, just a kind of an even kill and I, I still could have teetered either way. That's when I brought myself into the mushrooms. I started, I, I gave myself a great reset after I got myself clean and, and on a good path. And once I reset my, my, got myself reset with my mushrooms, I have never looked back. This is 2015. I've never had any issues and I've had broken legs and I've had to have a pain pill, you know, like for five days, never caused me a problem. You know oh, what I mean? It's so, so here's the thing. And cause I'm, I'm a bedside nurse. I've worked in the ICU ED. <laughs> I see all this stuff. Once you've gone down the treacherous road of opioid addiction and you come back a lot of people are too afraid to ever touch them. I can't tell you how many people I have who will have a broken leg, broken femur, you, you know, like a, a, a major fracture. They're in excruciating pain and they'll just refuse it because they're so afraid of the addiction. And I try to tell them, so you already learned your lesson on this. If you can properly assess your pain level, and going in, tell yourself, once I'm below 8 out of 10 pain, I should not be taking these opioids anymore. You'll be okay. Right. But many, many people will not do that. They are so afraid of themselves. They're so afraid of the powerful addictive quality of that pain medication that they stay away. So that's actually good on you for feeling like what. Now, I also think that because you quit cold turkey on stuff, it, it gave you a confidence of like, Right. Like it gave you a, a a little boost for sure. It gave me a good empowerment. It did. Yes. I, that is a good thing that you brought up because yes, 
because not to go into another rabbit hole, but I, there's a lot of people I've talked to about their addictions and things, you know, and one of their biggest things that they worry about is um, one, the withdrawal process. They're yeah. so afraid, you know, of that. And, and, and another thing is they mistake actual pain for discomfort. And the slightest discomfort they start having, they're like, oh, I better go get a pill, you know. And then right. and then the thought of having to go through that, you know, it it it, it alters people. I can lot. tell you, you you nailed that. That that I don't know if I've had anybody ever express it that way, but in many clinical settings where I take care of people with chronic pain, it really becomes a thing of they can't tolerate or they've convinced themselves they can't tolerate even a tiny little bit of pain that the moment they don't feel wonderful, they have to, because that's the addictive quality. They're just looking for an excuse to pop another pill in their mouth, of course. So you know, now I'm not saying, you know, hey, you you go break a limb or you start having some horrible, horrible pain, you know, suck it up, buttercup, don't go seek right. medical advice, you know that. But in alignment with the 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 thinking that people have once they are in the opiate world i guess you could say yeah. yeah i've been there i know you know um not judging it's very easy to not want to feel that slightest discomfort right. and mistake yeah. it for pain and think that that's got to you know because you, you you tend to get asked a lot you know okay what's your pain level with zero to ten you know ten being the most com well you know someone that's like maybe a three we're going they're going to say they're an eight and it's I because it's oh, I know. gauges you know yeah oh yeah <laughs> i mean we get people they walk into the walk into triage they're farting around on their phone texting somebody i'm trying to triage them and, and i'm like so what's your pain level zero to ten? Oh, uh nine out of ten yeah no it's <laughs> not no, it's you're not squirming and writhing around. You don't look like you're ready to die. That's what nine out of ten pain looks like. So how how about we do this? Let's try that one again. Yeah. But you're right. That's what they do. So I, I think that's great. You use mushrooms uh as a, a component. Now I I do think that you use your willpower. Um, and that was awesome. Zoloft is supposed to be weaned off of. So I just want to clarify for people watching, uh, you can cold turkey opioids. You should not be cold turkeying uh, SSRIs like Zoloft. Now, you did it and you made it. Yeah, yeah that, that was probably that was probably pretty, pretty rough. Yeah, you're going from like, you know, artificially controlling, uh, you, you know, dopamine levels to, uh, yeah, they go away. So. All right. So that is great. That's a wonderful origin story. Um, I think a lot of people, their, their early mushroom memories are a whole lot of good times, you know, in their, their teens and their early twenties, partying, going to concerts. Yeah. Uh, that is definitely yeah. my early memories is just euphoria, happiness, endless laughter. Everything's funny. And then it's so cool to hear how people as adults, when they're, when they have different priorities, different, you know, different responsibilities can pull back this, this experience from their youth. And it becomes a completely different thing. It becomes a, a tool to recover. It becomes a way of healing from, from trauma. I think that's wonderful. So now mayhem I know you've been growing mushrooms for a hot minute, so I, I imagine your your origin story is gonna, gonna go way back. So let's let let's hear how mushrooms first entered the picture for you. Well, other I, I, there, I have one memory of, of of just hearing of mushrooms in junior high, and that was by one of our just. I'm from a small town, so I mean it, there was. There was just like, you know, that one kid that, you know, brought right. pot into the whole community, you know, it was him right. that you talked to, you know, right. but one time, but that was it in passing, and, you know, and uh, fast forward to early 90s, I was uh, in between assignments, and I was hanging out with a buddy of mine, Santana, and we were down at his place outside of Ensenada, Mexico, and uh, we went to his grandfather's farm 
he said he needed my help with some things today to help his grandfather. And I was, I was cool with that. Uh, his grandfather for his village grows their mushrooms. I had no clue. I was just there going there to help, you know, and I get there and he's explaining to me their, 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 their ways and their rituals and the grandfather's broken English and my lack of Spanish and Santana trying to, you know, translate everything and keep up with the chores that he had because his grandpa was on him about that. Um, this is a this is a family thing. It was going to be his job in a, in a, in in some time to to make sure that the, the village has. It's not like they go around and pass them out. They they explain it that that this is a sacred crop that is that is cultivated for the needs of of the community when they need it and for ceremonies and stuff like that. Of but that's not anything that I understood at that time. So, you know, we're out there and, and, and we're, we're, we did the whole process and this was like, compared to today, this would be like unheard of. No, you cannot do that. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. Um, we used to make the substrate. It was, it was, uh, there was a uh, cow manure, there was um, sugar cane. Sugar cane pulp. Uh, uh, there's a name for it. Uh, it's a weird spelling. Uh, it's a great uh, Scrabble word. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's probably like, well, like an Aztec word or a Mayan word where it's got a lot of X's and L's and. Yeah. Bogalese or something. It's, well, yeah. we would mix that and, and the manure and we would put it in like a pillowcase and we would boil it for. I uh, guess two hours. <laughs> okay. You know, they would put it down in it, then they would hang it. I bet that smelled it. great. Sweet, um, sweet and sweet and poopy. There you go. Yeah. Well, we were well, we boiled substrate in, in a pillowcase for like two hours. And it wasn't just one barrel. It was, it was, there was quite a few of them. I mean, we had yeah. little fires going underneath them and stuff. And yeah. and I I'm, I'm like not understanding at all, but I, I'm doing as I am told because that's what <laughs> I was told yeah. to do. Um, Mi casa, su casa, brother. That's yet. Uh, I lived in SoCal for 16 years, and if you get invited to to a party, you're you're helping out. You're you're one of the family real fast. Yeah. 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 That's that. That's yeah. And you screw up, and you're one of the family. You get it too. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the process was after it dried. They put it in the in the trash bags. Okay. Now the grain prep was basically the same, but we they didn't PC it. It was a it was a double boil bath. If okay. if that's familiar with anybody old canning and stuff like that, and they used corn, uh, regular corn or field corn, and uh, they used spores from the previous crop, and it, it was then there was no. LC or anything like that. It was primitive. it was it was <laughs> kind of primitive, but it it worked. And and they had they had the jars in the cabinets just like we do today. I mean that was that was a step that I missed that time. I went back and did this with them a couple of times because it was it was pretty interesting. And and this is where we went in between assignments. So, you know, I helped out. But we after the dried and we. We put it in the trash bags. They would mix the spawn in it and inside of a trash bag. Just just mix it all. Uh, just one big old jar. So you can't one just one a little bit over a quart, I reckon. Mm -hmm. And they would dump that into the trash bag, put some cotton in the in the top of it, <laughs> and seal it with some baling wire. You know, and then they would set it on a water bed. Oh. Okay. And they would set the temperature in it was Celsius because we're the only people that use like regular right. numbers. But it was it was like 75 degrees. Okay. Okay. And after a time, we would come back and it would be the day. And they would go in there and they would prop up some some pipe or bamboo. It was bamboo at first, over the over the waterbed and cover it with plastic and put a fan at the end of it 
<laughs> just okay. cut those bags open and cut the temperature down. And okay. those things would just pop wow. out. Just, yeah. oh, it was incredible. Wow. And that was... That An was, entire waterbed. <laughs> yeah, it was... <laughs> And it was attached to harvest that you think. Oh, oh, wait a minute. So when you said waterbed, I was thinking more like just in the abstract, like a some sort of bath. You mean a literal waterbed from the eighties? Yeah, nineteen seventies waterbed. Oh, oh yeah, because you could, yeah, because you could control the temp on those. Wow. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. man, old old Mexican grandpa in Ensenada is using some eight. He's recycling some old. He threw all those water beds out, and here he has grown mushrooms on them. I love that. I would love to have one of those and do that again. It was the coolest process. Just oh, take cool. one hand and go all the way down the other. They would just stick the bags, yeah. the big trash bags that had the, the substrate from the pillowcase, and it was like a full pillowcase, like a pillow's in it. And, you know, just open it up into the water bed. And then... Well, so it's interesting you tell this story because this is such a foreign way to grow mushrooms. It reminds me of a story I heard. I had a guy from Canada on and he told a story about um, sneaking into uh, some, some old guys. Uh, what was a little a, a grow shed, but he but they had <laughs> set it up in there. So it was so dank and humid in there. And that's that's how he grows mushrooms. But again, you know, it's not sterile. It, it, it's there's not the the word HEPA never entered the picture and all that stuff. And yet he would walk in and he he would steal these guys mushrooms from him. And it, it's <laughs> oh, wow. always fascinating to hear these other ways of very primitive grows because I mean we all know if if we have been paying attention on the internet. Culture's been using these mushrooms for thousands and thousands of years, if not, I mean, we only have evidence for thousands of years back. It, it yeah. could have been forever. You know, the, the stoned ape theory could be true and it could be the whole reason that we are, you know, the fancy apes that we are, who knows? But, but anyway, hearing that, man, we used to go down in Ensenada. It, it became, it changed. We stopped going down there, but you were still back. That was back when it was still probably a real cool time just to sneak over the border and get well, down to Ensenada. Yeah, yeah, still still good. I think it, yeah, maybe, maybe around 2005, that. 2006 is when for us, we were like, okay, we're not going here anymore. It got too touristy. No. It got trickier. Yeah, but anyway, Dude, that's that's a very cool, you know, shout out to your your boy Santana for hooking hooking you up with that that experience. That's super, super cool. So so you had this experience in the 90s. Now get us to to where you're you're growing your own mushrooms. Well, uh my mom, she was suffering from depression really bad. And I just I mean, I knew that it worked for them. So I was, then I started trying to cultivate my own in my closet and, you know, and get a little something so I could have the conversation with my mom. Now, my mom grew up during the era of reefer madness. I mean, she's seen those, those movies at school, you know, one hit a pot and your your life's over, you're you're gone crazy. All right, so my mom, she she had a healthy respect for when the government tells you that something's bad, you know. Right. And it was really hard to even approach to have this conversation, and I never was able to. And I really regret that to this day, because I really believe in the medicine. But, you know, I couldn't help her, so I try to help others, and I just can't, like, pass out mushrooms to everybody, so I try to teach them to grow, you know. I, I believe that there is room, keeping the, the laws that they have now, that there, there should be some kind of if you can grow an all natural product and not add any kind of chemicals to it, you know, you can't grow a, a poppy plant and make heroin because you got to add chemicals. But if you can grow a little weed for yourself and a little mushrooms that you don't have to add anything to, you should be able to get away. Now, if you try to start selling it to your buddies and stuff, then the regular laws can come into effect. Sure. You should be able to grow your own naturally grown medicine if you don't have to add any kind of chemicals to it I, now i, love that. I mean i can grow a tomato exactly 
And this was here before we were. So who's yeah. who are we to say that this is bad and you can't have it you for gonna, your you own gonna, personal consumption? You gonna make a tree illegal? If you gonna make a seagull illegal on the beach? I'm with you. It's stupid. But I mean, I also on the flip side, I, I'm definitely not trying to defend government, but government, right? All all people in power, who are they afraid of? They're they're afraid of all the peasants. They're afraid of all the people that they rule over. So, man, I can only imagine how Nixon and all these cronies back in, in the 70s were just freaking out. Like, oh, man, we got the blacks trying to get some rights. We got the hippies don't want to go to work. Man, they were probably quaking in their boots back then, just thinking, oh, they're probably just so afraid. So here we are. You know, they they banned it all. They made it all Schedule 1. I mean, Schedule 1 for weed's the most absurd thing I've ever heard of in my entire life. Cocaine a Schedule 2. What? Exactly. <laughs> None of it makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. and, and again, like, marijuana and Mushrooms are still Schedule 1, and yet, like, I mean, there is already a mountain of evidence to show therapeutic benefit to this stuff. Like, what's it going to take to get that stuff rescheduled? Because Schedule 1 means no medical benefit at all, and we already know it's well, not true. <laughs> well, it's obvious that there is people that do not want this to happen yeah. and do not yep. want people to be able to heal themselves with something yep. they can grow in their closet in two months' time. Yep. Because... 100%. The pharmaceutical industry loves customers for life. They don't for like life. cure. They like to give you a yep. daily supplement. Yeah. And that's that's money each day into their pocket for each one of those pills. Be it you pay for it, or your insurance pays for it, or Medicare pays for it. Yep. Don't matter. It's money in their pockets. So of course they don't want anything that's going to cure you. That's right. just you know cutting their own throat. Right. What twenty five dollar mushroom trip cures uh, cigarette addiction or nicotine patch for the next thirty years? What do they want? Of course, yeah. Rough on the body. Those yep. nicotine patches are horrible for the body. <laughs> don't don't even get me started on that. Now I will tell yeah. you this: my personal belief is that what we are addicted to, if we are addicted to a cigarette, is we are addicted to this. The ritual. The ritual. I would agree man. 100%. Breathing and ritual. Would, it's a breathing yeah. ritual, right? It, it calms mm -hmm. you down. What What did your mom tell you when you were a little kid getting all mad about something? You go take 10 deep breaths. Yep. And sure, there's a little well, nicotine. There's definitely. A, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. But, but yeah, I, and I, man, I tell a lot of patients that I say, man, I, what if I told you you're addicted and you need a breathing ritual? You need breathing exercises. <laughs> don't even, don't even, tomorrow you go home, you don't even have the agenda to quit smoking. But when you go to have your cigarette, before you have your cigarette, go take your 10 slow deep breaths, like mimic that you're smoking your cigarette. And then when you're done, just ask yourself, how do I feel right now? Do I feel better? Yeah. And I, I've had a couple come back going, it worked. I don't smoke anymore. And I've had others come back going, no, nah, I like my cigarettes, but yep. And then the mushrooms just get you, get you going. You don't even have to think about it. And for some reason, you just, after that trip, you're just not smoking anymore for some reason, half the time, right? The studies are saying that over 40% of people have one macro dose uh, experience of mushrooms and they're not smoking cigarettes anymore. Freaking miraculous. So, so, all right. So you, and this is another story that we hear, we hear quite a bit where what brings us into this space is either a, a desire to use the medicine to heal ourselves or to help somebody we love. So I, I think that's, that's beautiful. Uh, I have heard so many stories of people going, I just couldn't convince my mom or dad to do it. Or I got a friend right now who wants the, the brother had a traumatic brain injury Trying to get him to, to use mushrooms, can't do it. He's too straight laced. He's convinced himself it's the devil or it's I don't I don't even know what these people yeah. get themselves convinced about. But clearly not desperate enough. That's what I say to everybody when, when I'm talking to them in the hospital. They're they're sitting there trying to get off their opioids. It's n it's never enough with opioids because you build a tolerance up and then you need more and more and more. And I just say, hey man. 
you know, really, you're not, you're not just going to try cannabis? Oh, never. Not that hippie shit. Blah, blah, blah. I, and you get all the negativity and I go, well, you must like being on opioids then. Well, it's because there's such a, a, a program of misinformation. Yeah. And, and that's what it is. It's just a lack of somebody being able to make an informed decision because they don't have the proper information. Right. Well, you know, on my experience, my main thing with such a stuff, I, like I said, I don't recommend everybody quitting cold turkey, but for what I did, I used a strong regimen of cannabis for two things. One, a big problem with withdrawal is nausea, okay? Nausea, really bad. And another was nerves. And I already was getting off of my Zoloft, and my nerves were going to be off the charts anyway. Right. So cannabis was a no-brainer for me, yep. you know? And, and I could not have done what I had done without it. There's no way. Yeah. You know, it wouldn't have mattered if I changed my diet or anything. I had to get my mind right without these other drugs taking control of my mind, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and, and, and to be to be honest, right, the the side effects of mushrooms, the side effects of cannabis. I, I mean, so the only thing we're seeing in the ER with cannabis is some people they start dabbing, they're, they're using wax, they're using shatter, and just the amount and the concentration they're hitting is so high that they get this thing called hyperemesis syndrome. And it, it, yeah. it's from too much too much THC in their body, and they are violently throwing up for, for weeks at a time until they finally, you know, have to come into the yeah. ER and we say, no, guess what, sorry. you gotta get off that, you gotta get off that stuff. Um, other than that one situation, and that's just from the way people are doing cannabis now, just a good old fashioned roll in a joint or a blunt. That's not, that's what I did. <laughs> not gonna, not gonna give you any of those problems, right? Do it the way our ancestors been doing it for, for a very long time and, and you're good. So, all right. So, so that definitely gives me a very cool broad understanding of kind of how, how you guys got into the space. Let's do this. Let's talk about how you got from that to where you are now, which is you guys provide products for this community. You guys uh, have a presence on Facebook. You you guys are, are known players in this little micro community we're in. Get us to how you got to that point. Well, okay. I'm gonna say it was a date night that we um... for me it was almost like a storybook because I I was full blown addicted. I got myself through the withdrawal thing, through through being sober, you know, standing on my own in my own accord. I started helping people. I had a I, w I was in a few classes and I started helping other people with their things and everything. And then they we, I was with Mayhem and we started talking about the mushrooms and, and the progress and the no most natural next step was to start cultivating, which is something I hadn't tapped into. So for me, it just fell into place and he gave me the basics and the fundamentals on how to cultivate. Nice. So his ways we the you know he he gave me his ways and everything and then we had a date night one night and we were talking about well i wonder how people do cultivate out there these days you know what i mean you know because we did not have a facebook presence we're 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 kind of older you know we're real we're we're real reserved and everything and and so we got on there and we're like, well, there's probably groups. So we got on there and we joined a few groups and I'm not going to mention names, just one in particular. They were not happy with us. <laughs> just it. I, I, I had a little tent, you know, yeah. and it, it, it didn't really This work. was my profile, you and know. It was, just, it was just some tent pictures and, you know, the, the trade great and stuff but it, it was it was not accepted in the in the community or, or something okay, right. because we were yeah. they were like that's just the contaminates waiting to happen you I know that was just the, the but they started asking us questions about like hepa filters and stuff like that and it was my pro you know they we started answering them you know it wasn't like 
I mean, we're not just going to show it and then run away. Yeah, you know, you know and right. so I, for some reason, out of the blue, it was like just we answered him. Everything was fine. We didn't have any bad words or anything. We just kind of disconnected and got off and went on about our day. The next day, we were going to get back on and see what was going on, learn some more, actually. And we were booted. Oh. And we were like, well, that was nasty. No, nothing's so changed. We like, nothing's changed. Yep. Still that. Yep. This was back in 2019. Okay. So that's how. We, we decided, well, you know what? It doesn't have to be this way. There are people out here. Just want to learn. Just want to learn to make their own medicine. They, they, they don't have to be, you know, any questions, even if it's repeated a hundred times, should be answered, you know? Yeah. And we're like, there's got to be a better way around helping people. So we're like, well, we'll just start our own group. So <laughs> we started Shroom Tech. <laughs> yeah. And um, this was back in 2019, and we started, you know, welcoming people. New, we, we started catering to the news, okay? Yep. And our only way that we grow is through liquid cultures. Now, back in 2019, apparently this was a cuss word. Right. Yeah. You know, people did not accept it. They did not. Uh, apparently it was taboo and unfamiliarly tapped territory i don't now, know what it was, but. i'll tell you my perspective on that this is from the things that i was told i came into this space around it was 2020 2020 or 2021 i can't remember now but um so what i was told is so there were a lot of unscrupulous people on reddit and so there was uh some of the early big push for lc was people that were just they had no scruples they didn't care and a lot of times those products were bad so there was already a stigma around lc products are typically coming from unscrupulous vendors that don't give a shit about you now the the motivation though is if i sell you a multi-spore syringe right and i show you a picture of my grow what you grow ain't gonna look like that until you learn about isolating and and developing traits and all that kind of stuff so boy, it was appealing to sell a liquid culture because I could show you a picture and say, I just grew this. I'm selling you the clone culture of that fruit and odds are you're going to get something that looks pretty similar to that. So people wanted LC and yet these old school people that wants everybody to know the, you know, the fullest way, like everything's got to go back to spore. Everything's got to go back to spore. They didn't like that. So you, you got that going on. And then in addition to all that, you have a legal parameter, which is spores for microscopy purposes only are legal, in, you know, to, to barter, buy, sell, trade in all states, but three. So LC then crosses a line. This was the thinking was that LC crosses line. Now, realistically, most of these entities, if they intercepted LC, uh, their reagent tests would not test positive. So, so that was sort of a, a overblown concern but that was there were definitely people that i was around that were like stay the frick away from that because of the fact that the minute you grow it it turns into this illegal thing so my guess yeah. is you were getting a lot of heat back then for lc yeah. yes but the the truth of the matter is that there is no psilocybin which is the illegal component in lc it does uh, uh, the psilocybin does not start until the primordial knots. So until you take that LC out of that syringe and go through the other process, that is a totally legal product. Yeah, I so my take and from I've talked to a few super high level scientists. What mm -hmm. what they tell me is if there is any any psilocybin in there it is at such a low level that even my machine would have have trouble detecting it and right. that, that yes you don't see any actual quantity any testable quantity un until you're you're at least myceliating a cake okay well the thing about it is when you're a newbie, like i said we began our group and we wanted to cater to the newbies okay 
Now, throughout the community I've seen in groups, you know, they're like, okay, how do I get started? How do I learn? What do I do? You know, and they're like, learn agar first. And okay, yes, agar is very important. Okay. And 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 especially when you want to get into your genetics and delve into your other little variables of cultivating, okay? But also when you're a new person, it's overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All that knowledge on top of the grain prep, on top of the substrate, on top of the temperatures, on top of where you're going to grow, on top of what genetic, you know, the whole nine yards yeah. is a lot of stuff to take in. Okay. Now, agar is like a very intimidating subject for a lot of people when they go in there like, whoa, what's this? You know, because to them, a grain jar that's half colonized is exciting. Right. Okay. Yeah. So. What we started doing was just, I did the plate work for everybody. I would just take the spore. I would isolate it. I would do the plate work. I would transfer it into LC. I would grow it. I would cl collect the spores. I would clone it and then have a LC that produced. And I did all the work for them right. and put it out there so that they would, you know, this is, you know, unless you just really <laughs> don't do anything sterile this is going to be foolproof you're going to have a successful grow right you know because when 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 that's another thing that that discourages new people they go through a lot of stuff and then they'll get contamination and they're like well i just don't this is too hard i don't want to do this no more i'm never going to get there you know and they give up now the experience yeah. i've had is that you, some people will come to you with too much information. Yes. Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. They, they've seen all the videos, read all yeah. the stuff, but they still don't know what to do. Uh, yeah. oh, I, I call it, this is, this is like middle-class white guy syndrome is they want to get it right. They want to swing their dick right out of the gate. So they want to do it perfect. It's this little dream. They all have, I'm going to, I'm going to be the guy who studied enough and read a, enough about it, watched enough YouTube videos, and I'm going to be perfect out of the gate. And I'm just, those people crack me up. I'm always like, when you going to grow some mushrooms, brother, when you going to exactly. actually grow some mushrooms, it's time. Throw that notoriety out the door when you first learn, you know, because you need to, you need to really, and see, that's one of the things that I love about how we grow, because when we grow, we don't just grow a tub of this and maybe a few of these for here, or you know, and, and a lot of that's because we're not, we don't create, we're not genetic creators or anything like that. Okay. But what I do love to do is search for those sexy phenotypes. Sure. And so I, if I, okay, like for instance, I'm going to use Dave a lot because I love Dave Wombat. He's my buddy. <laughs> He's great. And I, I mean, you're him. not the only person that likes Dave Wombat. I can tell you that. Yeah. Well, we, He's we a cool guy. A lot. We, we text a lot, you know, and, and, and as a matter of fact, I told him a couple days ago because he was taking a while to answer me. I said, if you don't answer me back, I'm going to drop dead, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So, and of course, I'm glad I didn't really mean that. But anyway, he I like to use his genetics, okay? Yeah. And that's one of the things. And so I'll get my thing, you know, and we'll, I'll, I'll use like his AMAC. But I won't grow just one or two tubs. I'll inoculate 16 to 20 bags. Right. And I, I want to see all the expressions at once. And that's one of the other beauties of LC, you know, and then I'll pick yeah. out which one you want to work with, you know. And so when, when the newbie gets that first successful grow, oh, they get that fever. Oh, they're ready to explore more. You know, they don't give up, you know. And that's one of the things we try to encourage in our group. You know, hey, and we don't allow bashing. We don't allow shaming. You know, it may be the most silliest, ridiculous question or thing you've ever seen in your life. But, hey, they thought enough to come forward and ask. Right. They have a question on their mind. So. You know, that's one of the things we don't tolerate in our group is we want you to ask. We want you to learn. We want you to try. And just because this is how we're doing it does not mean that, by God, that's how you do it or you're not going to succeed. Right. You know, what yeah, I mean? everybody no. doesn't have to go buy a waterbed from the 80s. <laughs> right. Right. It works. Yeah. You I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll use an example. When I started. I watched a video from this Veritas Mycology and they had taken just a little desktop HEPA air filter 
and they had taped a garment bag like you'd get from a dry cleaners. And they taped it to it and they made themselves a little positive pressure bag. And I said, oh, that's cheap. I can, that's 40 bucks. Let's, let's give that a try. And I did it. And, and my concern was the air was turbulent in there. I cut some slits. I reinforced it with some, you know, some two inch tape and uh, I could keep all my stuff in there. I would douse it to the nth degree with isopropyl, let it run, let it dry out. And then I do my work. And I probably did at least a thousand, if not close to 2000 transfers that way before I got a real good deal on my flow hood off eBay. And, and then, you know, I never looked back, but so for that period of time, I was using it. I never had a single contamination. It absolutely 100% worked. So it was like right before I knew I had this flow hood coming. I wanted to book in my little story about this, this tech I used and I did a post about it. And I immediately had these guys you're talking about, they had to go on and on. It don't work. It don't work. It don't work. It don't work. Well, it worked for me. So what do you know? Very innovative, you know, it worked, it worked for me. So, you, and, and there's another video out right now bashing it, saying that it doesn't work. They're fucking wrong because they didn't do it themselves. It works. Can it, it? Is it perfect? No. Could you set that up? And if you don't do a few things right, could it be problematic? Sure. But man, people real quick to want to say what works and what doesn't work. And I love having people on the show going, you know what? That thing that everybody says doesn't work, works great for us. Yeah. I love you that. You know, that's the thing. Just you don't have to have the most elaborate, most expensive, fancy equipment, you know, and you can do it without a flow hood. I do. You know, and he, yeah. he and he, I knew, mean, I, I, I grew up. I mean, I grew for years with without yeah. a flow hood. With yeah. I mean, the the cleanest I ever the 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 cleanest I ever had was when I had an air cleaner in the room that you know specifically yeah. gets down into the small micron sizes. But like for doing work and stuff like that, when I thought it was a real threat, I put a a twenty inch box fan with a good filter on top of it. Yep. Yeah. It, yeah. it does just fine. Yep. Oh, I mean. We, it, we have, we had a guy on, uh, he goes by the name of Whitebeard. He, he's real big on the box fan tech. You know, you put a Merv 13 filter on the front, you put a Merv 7 on the back. And uh, I got people who I tell to use that as a, to tide them over till they can save up their money for their flow hoods. And then two years later, they're still using it going, well, it's, it works for me. I, well, why am I going to spend a thousand bucks? On? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Before I even had a, my first flow hood, when I was doing my agar, he, see, and this is one of the things I love about him. He innovates and comes up with yeah. the best things. He made me the best SAB box, still air box. He, yeah. you know, not, I know you've seen the, you know, the mono tub with the holes, you know, you put your arms in and stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I don't see too well. And, and so he installed a light bar up at the top, yeah. you know, clip it on. And he's, he's, he had it going on. He put sure sleeves in the arm. Yeah, he put, oh, yes. And he also made me a, he cut a little rectangle slit about like that in it and put plexiglass yep. and sealed it. And Oh, I tell I everybody mean, to do that. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's not a hard hack and it works great. No, and, yeah. and it's amazing. I, I didn't have a problem with my agar either. As a matter of fact, you know, in some cases, I think that uh, doing it in an SAB, if you can keep it good and clean in there, you know, that still air is still air. That means nothing's going right. to go in there, you know. Yep. So... You know, uh, I think those are some, you know, and, and it didn't cost what, maybe lights, everything, maybe 45 bucks all together, yep. you know, just yep. the total. Made and, from parts we had around that. You know, house. very helpful. Because, <laughs> yeah. see, yeah. not not everybody's got a giant barn. Not everybody's got a garage. Some people grow in mushrooms in New York City. I got a guy that grows it in his apartment. He can't have a flow hood. He can't have, he's for the sake of not disturbing his neighbors, he has to use a still air box. Right. Has to. Some okay. people don't have the space. Some people don't have friendly neighbors, right? Like when, when I cook popcorn, my first cook, it's under pressure just to speed it up. And I can walk outside and I can pull the weight off and let it rapidly depressurize because time is money. 
And mm -hmm. uh, other people go, well, I could never do that. My neighbor would have would would be over in, in my yard going, what you doing over there? What you you know? And and I can't draw attention to myself. I hear stories of people who got to smuggle in when they go buy grain from the feed store. They got to smuggle it in to their house and nobody because they got the nosiest fucking neighbors of all time. So there are so many different situations growers are in. There has to be a bunch of ways to skin the same cat. Just yeah, there's, there's got to be. So that's why we have a few different yeah. grow products. That's what we started seeing was that people started buying our liquid cultures. They started getting results. And there's a few hurdles we had to overcome. Two of them are really understandable. One, we had to get a reputation out there. You know, we're not sure. scammers. You're not going to get something or pay for something. You're not going to get it. So, you know, right. and like I said, we began all this in 2019, you know, so people had to be comfortable with that. Then they had to start being comfortable with, you know, obviously their results, you know, yeah. once we started having success stories and people started realizing, Hey, these people aren't, you know, they're in it for the long haul. And we started right. really being involved in our group. And one of the things about us is I'm very I'm sorry he's trying to get me in a better angle one of the things is I'm okay this has become this is our this is our life yeah we don't get up in the morning and 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 clock go go get ready for work go clock in for eight hours come home and do some of this stuff take care of you know we are involved all day long yeah from sunrise to till we hit the bed at night okay so and part of that is i'm available to a lot of people on messenger when they just have a random question right. when they have you know and 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 no and then people are all the time you know you should charge you should just well sometimes it's just a matter of hey if she's available on the spot i need to know that you know and right. and that's part of taking care of the new people and yeah they so, need their hand held they need they some they need somebody to hold their hand for sure sometimes they just need somebody to tell them it's okay for you to do it the way that you're saying. You know, they have all the information. They just need somebody to say, yes, your plan is valid. Go for it. You know, they just of, need that just yeah. little extra push. Yeah, or second opinions or stuff. And there are a lot of people that we have outright mentored and just guided them right from inoculation point up to, there's a couple people we've created monsters. They're, in, they're yeah. man, they yeah. <laughs> they're on there now all the time, you know, and so, but, but along the way, being involved with community, giving, you know, being available on messenger, making, um, our liquid cultures available and things. And, 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 you know, after about a year or two, we started noticing others getting scammed, others getting bunk product and things, and just not being able to figure it out. So he started mass producing grain bags and we started making that available to, you know, and, and, um, we don't stockpile them, you know, we don't make like a hundred this month and sell them until they're gone. You know, we actually, we do it about every 10 days. We wait until there's orders and then we make a bunch and then right. get Made those order. orders. That's yeah. great. You know, so, and, and we're trying to get down all the, we're just trying to help people get their grow better and have a better experience, you know? And then we started hearing a lot of people asking about all in ones, all in ones, all in ones. Okay. And we started, you know, we'll go in other places looking at the market and seeing what they look like and how they're set up. And yes. and I feel like they're just trying to get over on somebody that actually wants to just grow. I mean, right. it's as simple as that. And they found something and they fell victim to good wording. Right. Um, you know, but a pro to that for some new people, you know, hey, we don't have to prep anything. We can just, you know, and and so that might be if they can figure it out and have something worthy to work with, they might be able to, you know, pull it off the first time with that. Right. So needless to say, Mayhem started messing around, working with all in ones and figured out one. And we started growing with them and that's what a lot of those pictures were that i had seen you know, yeah everything. we're we're gonna go through a, we're gonna go through them all yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> those, those were the, you know he he's designed them totally different than from everything we've seen 
yeah. <laughs> and it actually works. We've had great success. We've had other people that have done them, and they've had great success. And you I, know, man, so. I'm not gonna lie. When they first hit the hit the scene, I was real skeptical about them, and uh, people didn't give up, and they kept working them. And now I know a handful of people that have a, a truly great all-in-one bag product. And there are people who it's the only way they're going to ever be able to grow mushrooms is if they can get their hand on a, yeah. a, on an LC and an all-in-one bag and they're rocking and rolling. And like yeah. you said, that's, that's what you need. Some people, if you qualify people in the beginning and they say, I want to grow mushrooms, teach me. And I say, why do you want to grow mushrooms? Well, I want to try the medicine. Well, okay. So step one, let's get you some medicine. Step two, you know, I don't need to pull you down this rabbit hole I'm in. I'm, I'm going to wait for you to jump. So let's just get you growing some medicine. And, and if like, like Kimberly said, if when you get that first flush, you just, your jaw drops and it changes you and you just are like, I got to keep doing this. Great. Other people go, cool. This is all I need to do. And see, honestly, on that note, for people like me and my story, you know, overcoming addiction and, 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 and climbing that mountain, getting a little bit higher up, you know, within myself, cultivation opened up a whole new world of... I'm with you. It's so therapeutic. So it therapeutic. It so brings you... It, 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 that in itself is a healing process yeah. for you. I mean, I will Maybe link that. In the medicine. <laughs> yeah, I will link that. That is similar to if you've ever just grown a tomato plant. And the first yeah, time you there. slice that tomato and put it on a BLT, and first <laughs> off, it tastes so much better than anything you get get in the grocery store. But second, <laughs> you grew it. You did the work. It's yours. You You have a relationship with that thing. Or uh, first time you go hunting and you skin your first deer and, and you go through all the work, it it deepens your connection to that thing. It, it it does change the experience. But so, I mean, like it's one thing to grow a tomato and slice it up and go, well, I grew this tomato. It's another to grow your own medicine and to have these amazing experiences. I, I mean, I don't care who you are. If you grew it, it is going to affect your trip differently than if you bought it from a guy with sparkly hair at a rave. You're, it's you're just, it's absolutely gonna. correct. It's gonna. It's gonna. There's nothing you can do about it. Like you don't even you don't even have to set the setting. You set the setting by growing it yourself. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? You guys already know this because it happened to you guys. And this is also a story that I'm I'm hearing repeatedly is it had such a profound impact on me in my life that, I mean, I did, it wasn't even a thought process. Of course, I'm going to start sharing this with other people, right? Exactly. Of course, yep. if I find the fountain of youth, I'm going to bring my grandma. <laughs> of course, I'm going to share this, right? Like, right. of course. And I love that you guys, um, the fact that you went for an all-in-one bag says to me, you're really about getting the medicine out to people in an efficient way because man, otherwise it's a lot, right? Yeah. A pressure yeah. cooker and a still air box and a flow hood and a, and like, right. We talk about the flow hood and the pressure cooker all the time. But I mean, as you can see, and I'm sure you guys know, I got shelves full of all sorts of shit. There's a mm -hmm. lot of stuff you got to buy. If you want to do everything, if, if you're, um, if you're doing your own plate work, if you're doing your own spore work, if you're doing your own sub and grain and all that, it is it is a process. At the end of the day, is it worth it? Yeah, it's totally worth it. But sometimes you got to get, you know, it's you got to get got to hand out a free sample. So an all in one bag and an LC and I'm growing mushrooms. Well, see, it's amazing. Yeah. The thing is, a lot of people that are wanting to begin to try to dabble in the whole process have a limited income. You know, they might, yes. they might yeah. be a veteran with PTSD. They might be on disability or whatever, you know, and it's it's not cheap to live anymore. Just simply live. It's and not. so, you know, for them to 
it's 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 very important for them to have success. Yeah. You know, I mean, and 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 you know, they 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 can't afford to just try this crappy all in one and 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 some bunk stuff and and be out like god i've seen 60 80 dollars for that you know and yep. and and then turn around and try again you know and so then the, the defeats the whole purpose of them being able to help themselves and what couldn't the agree, sad, couldn't agree more with that is is they don't know if it was something that they did or if it was a bad yes. product yes so we no. can package, you know, so we kind of like everybody in our group or everybody that we start our brood, I guess you could say, you know, that way we can get, we, 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 we know what we're giving them. We grow, yep. we, we, we use the, the same thing. We use the same things, you yep. know, and, yep. and, and, and we, we make ourselves available so that if they're like, Hey, this is happening to my bag. Do you have any other suggestion? You know, I'll, I'll sit there with them together. I'll be like, send me a picture. Let's figure this out. You know, we'll figure yeah. some stuff out to yeah. coach them along the way with their Use product. The temperature. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, but you know, that way, you know, we don't want to just someone buy our product and then just, okay, well, good luck. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it really is important to us how it's affected them and, and how it's yep. changed them. Yeah. And that's where yeah. the gratification comes from too, right? That's the difference between yeah. being a corporation who cares about bottom line and shareholder profitability mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah versus, right? This is the one special thing we have that we will always have over big brother, big pharma, big whatever, you yeah. know, insert, insert here is yeah. that relationship. There will be a relationship. Yeah, it's got to be. But if our way. community don't start pulling together ourselves, they're going to take it away from us. We, they really will. Yes. And, and even and even if we pull together, they're still going to try to take it away from us. Oh, oh we have to. We have to. If we have any chance, we got to come together. Couldn't agree more. United we stand, divided we fall. Because there's a lot of people doing some amazing work right now. Yeah. Um, genetics and stuff like that. That is that is where the, the, the mainstream of this hobby that we're so in love with, that's that's where the, the corporation is going to come in. They're going to try to buy the seeds so they can control the medicine and stuff like that yeah. to that point. Yeah. And there there's there's ways that we can you can protect your stuff, but it is so expensive. Oh. It's to be honest with you, maybe the lawyer really thinks highly of himself and he likes to eat steak. But we talked to some some attorneys about doing this, and it's a million dollars to patent your own oh, genetic yeah. strain. Easily. Yeah. And but there's things that you can there's stuff that I want to teach people that they can do for themselves to to protect some of their stuff. Stuff that I we had to learn the hard way. You know, we we wanted <laughs> but when you try to start talking business with people, they think like you're trying to get to, you know, you the defensive mechanisms, oh, you, yeah. know, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it, we're not coming at you like that. We're coming here to, to show you that you're not protected and we right. want to help you protect yourself. Yep. There's a lot of stuff in the community. And that's, that's, yeah. that's going to be the worst thing for it is, is, is when they take away you know, say, nope, you can't grow this no more because we own it, you know? Yep. Oh, yeah. And they will. And you don't have more lawyers than they do. Exactly. Once that game happens, you're done. That's what cracks me up about all these people right now going, oh, my 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 product has a trademark and my product has a this and my product has a that. Well, that's step fucking one. Step two is, do you have the resources, and by that I mean an endless supply of money, to hire these crazy $400 an hour attorneys who are then going to pursue and protect your patent or your trademark or anything like that? And these people barely got the money. Like usually what happens is they pay the $1,500 or the two grand or the three grand saying, oh, we're going to get this patented. And then they get the response back from the government going, well, you didn't do this. You didn't do that. You didn't do the other thing. And now it's going to be another three grand. And they go, I'm out. They don't have the money. Yep. It's a, it's a big boy game. It it's is a big boy it game. Is. Now my whole take on, uh, on, you know, trying to patent genetics 
is I don't know. I look at it like this. It's just like with all uh, these synthetic drugs that are legal, right? So they, they make a certain synthetic drug illegal. You go on Alibaba or however you're connected with some of these Chinese uh, chemical companies, and you you all you got to say to them is, this is illegal now. Can you do another version of that for me? And then they make another version, and, and it just it never ends. So yeah. for me, I don't know if I could ever have something so special that I would be patenting it. I just know what makes me special is it's always my relationship my enth with people. It's my enthusiasm for what I do. Um, and at the end of the day, man, they can have all the laws they want. They are, look, they already got the laws and uh, it ain't stopping a whole influx of people right now going, I mean, you got some soccer moms that are definitely not buying illegal drugs from anywhere, but now they're, they're microdosing. It, yeah, they're, yeah. They're going for it. yeah i mean that hit mainstream it was on some yeah. talk show mom's yeah. on mushrooms, yeah. I mean, mushrooms. freaking awesome but i mean yeah. it, it's bringing a positive awareness yep to i mean to hear those stories and it was on fox news <clears throat> yep. there was there's they have a, a sad commentator joey jones since he's already brought it out but he had the best description about using mushrooms it's like you go to an interview with yourself. Mm -hmm. You sit across uh, the table from yourself. And that really hit me. And I was like, man, I got to talk to this guy. I mean, you know, he, 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 he gets it, you know, yeah. and I haven't talked to him yet, but <laughs> I'm still working on it. It's, I, I mean, it's, it's miraculous. And it's, it's a type of drug that big pharma doesn't have they don't have anything in their wheelhouse that that works like this one does and to your point it cures too much stuff i'm almost thinking they they're never going to want too much to do with it if they do it's going to be in the integration it's going to be in the therapeutic setting it's going to be that sort of thing but they're always going to look be looking for an angle to how can we keep people on this forever that's always the game they but my question is is when did mushrooms become alternative medicine when it was original? <laughs> right. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Well, oh, and it's not going to be. It's, it's, I mean, I say to a lot of people, microdosing, it's like the new cup of coffee, right? Why, why do people drink a cup of coffee in the morning? Because they're dragging ass. They're just trying to get a little pick me up. They want their day to go well. So they drink a cup of coffee, right? And you can drive by any Starbucks. I know you probably don't have one right by you. But uh, <laughs> I got one down the road, and every time I drive by it, the line is out, like it's out into the road in the morning. Yeah, so, somebody please explain that to me. I, dude, you could never get me to pay six bucks for a cup of coffee, but everybody does, and it's just full of fucking sugar. But that's that's a whole nother podcast. But, but yeah, people, right? People love their coffee. And, and and what does it do for their day? They feel like it sets them on a good trajectory. I can tell you for me, on a day I microdose, it definitely sets me on a good trajectory in a even better way than coffee ever could. So, it yeah, it's going to... It needs to be regular. There's a lot more stuff that needs... It, it, microdosing is... It, it has helped a lot of people that we have known. OK, but there are a few things that need to be, especially when it hits mainstream and they start d dabbling with the regulations and things, you know, for one thing, you know. Um, Mushrooms are not created equal. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, sure. you, you, if you, OK, for instance, you know, typical just for sake, um, a microdose might be 0.25 of a gram. OK. Well, 0.25 of a gram of golden teachers is not the same as 0.25 of a gram of ape. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and you need to know more about what's, you know, so there's things that need to be adjusted and regulated. And also, we're big believers in the whole body fruit as a microdose, not extract, not sure. extract from the mycelium. Yep. You know the actual whole body fruit, and you know, I mean, I'm I'm hoping that as as psilocybin becomes hopefully declassed, you know, and more accepted in things, that there's going to be more research on yep. the actual way 
to do the regimen, you know, and then, well, and then right, again, right now, I'll tell you this, the, the dose that that's the Holy grail in our community, because mm -hmm. that is the problem, even, even in one tub of fruit now. So whole body fruit, I, I like that. I'm with you, but in one tub, each whole body fruit might have a completely different psilocybin content. So at the end of the day, hundred percent, we got to figure out dosing, which usually come. Now, most people I know that seem to have their microdosing regimen down, they're using one cultigen and they're growing it the same way. And it's usually clone culture. And so they, they, they're, they're dialed it and it works, but every once in a while, you know, I, I take a micro dose and that one hit just a little bit harder. Maybe got five or 10 minutes where I'm like feeling a little hot, a little tingly. Okay. Not, not sub, not sub perceptual. I perceive that one today. So, but, <laughs> but overall, you know, I've never had a, and I'm, of course I'm not gonna, I don't know of anybody that's micro dosing apes now, maybe they're out there. I don't know, but they're, they're usually trying to stay pretty consistent so that they hit that. Now, my concern about micro dosing is there are some early research that says we should probably look into, is there any concern about taking this every single day? Is it going to do something to some of our receptor sites, whether it's in our heart or in our brains? So yes, we got to look into all that stuff. And, and most then good, the, the duration that? at that time also for yeah. how long, because you don't have to, like when you're on a prescription of something, you know, it's at, at one a day every month and, you know, for years and years and years on end. And, and that's what you've got to do to maintain your issue. Yeah. Well, with things, you know, I, I have seen, I have, I have been in communications with and have dabbled with people that have, like, they'll take a great reset. Then they'll turn around and microdose for the next six weeks, and then there's no need. Just every now and then they'll come back and reset. Yep. Now they that this is just an each individual case, I would imagine, you know. Yep. But there are ways that yes, you know, you can you can sit back and it would it. I would imagine they would have to get adjusted to one cultigen and then start worrying about what dose, you know, and how that would affect them. But no, it's not something that you would need to keep taking for a long period of time that's well, the beauty of microdosing <laughs> yeah so that is the correct way right you should be off it more than you're on it and it right. should be for a set period of time and we've right. definitely gotten we've gotten past that there are many people they're taking it every single day there are people that are don't really have an end date in mind I initially came into the space because I heard people were using it to treat their ADHD. And that's what brought me into the space. I have really bad ADHD. I didn't like any of the Western medicine I was on. So here I am checking it out. Now, I will say that I got concerned about being on it too often. So I'm never on it. I, I'm one day on, two days off. But then I'm also, that's I might weird. be on it for a month, but then I'll be off it for two months. Right? I, I'm not doing it all the time because I am still a little concerned about long-term effects. This is part of the reason I got off Adderall because I was concerned about the long-term effects of Adderall on my heart. That's good. For the same reason. That's, that's but good. A lot of these new drugs, right? They're coming out left and right and there are no long-term studies because they're too fucking new. So we yeah. don't know what any of this shit's doing. But now I, yeah, I will say this. A million times people, people the benefit. <laughs> yes. Now I have yeah. talked to cultivators who've been cultivating for several decades and they they have told me, oh man, I'm eating, you know, I'm eating a pin here and there. I'm doing it every single, every single day of their lives for 20 years. And they don't have heart failure. And they, you know what I mean? So I'm hoping that that some of these initial studies are, are overblown or, or whatever. I'm of, of course hoping that long-term we find out that this is just super, super safe most of the time. But yeah, we well, don't know any of those things. Well, we will never be able to get through studies until they take the, the, the criminal status away from it yep. for people to be honest with their yep. doctors. See, there's yep. two things, there's two people in life you never lie to, your lawyer and your doctor. Yep, 100%. And and <laughs> until you can be honest with your doctor and tell him, yeah, I dabble, you know, he doesn't know to look for other yep. signs and stuff. Yep. 
But until we can have that communi communication uh, openly and freely without prosecution, you know, right. we're still going to be a little bit stuck. I mean, it's happening. Cities and people are understanding. Yep. It's just we got some old heads off in the way. Yeah. Well, see, and 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 the two. Okay, when the beauty of taking microdoses in a regiment like that and things. Okay. Okay. For instance, we'll say Zoloft antidepressant. Okay, you you take your regimen on the day. You know you're supposed to take it the same period of, during the day. You know one a day, two a day, whatever it is. Okay, if you miss the dose, it throws you off. It does. Okay, but now taking microdoses and things, even though you're on your path of whatever it is you're taking, your you know your regimen. If if by some chance if something happens, you miss a dose or something, you're not going to be thrown off. Nothing is going to happen to you. You're not going to evolve or, you know, digress. You're not going to either way, you know, and, and you can perfectly be fine picking up the next day. You know, it's not like a thing like what Big Pharma does, you know. Agreed so 100%. They, they, yes. The, the uh, For me, like no side effects. I mean, the day this is like this is what gets me about alcoholics and and alcohol in general is man, if you can't just have a, a couple beers or, or a drink or two, the next day, man, we just never learn, right? That that hangover the next day, what what's it got you wanting to do? Well, have a drink to get over this hangover. I'm gonna have my little uh, bloody mary, right? It's awful. A hangover is an awful thing, man. The day after a macro dose. It's like the greatest day of your fucking life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything's possible. <laughs> it, it, it's it's unbelievable. And so, yeah, <clears throat> even just on the that perspective, it does really seem like it is astoundingly safe. I mean, of course, I I can heroic dose and I can jump off a bridge or something like that, right? Like I I I, I could I could do something stupid in, in a really bad trip, but realistically compared to all these other drugs that people are using, man, it, it's really looking pretty, pretty freaking safe. I, I do not hear people going, well, yeah, microdosing is great, but the side effects of X, Y, and Z, and, or, oh, the macrodose is great, but boy, the hangover the next, I mean, it's just, these are just not, it would be, if someone told you that, you would know they were fucking with you, because it's, it would be such a ridiculous <laughs> statement to me. Well, like Reaper Madness. <laughs> yeah. All right, let, let's do this. You guys sent me a bunch of pictures, and we've we've referenced a few things. So let, let's actually look at them. So I'm gonna start. You sent me. Uh, you've talked about your barn, and I know you kind of live in the middle of nowhere in, in the mountains. Um, so let's 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 you know if you live in the middle of the mountains, you you gotta have a barn, right? You gotta have a you gotta have something like that. So let's let's pull this up. All right, facility. So you guys aren't so far in the middle of nowhere. You still got the grid. I see you got your little meter out there. So, so that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah, we we've well, got power. You got power. Okay, you're not like running off a diesel generator or anything like that. Okay. No, no. no. Well, the, the barn is on power now. Our cabin is on solar. We had it at another part oh. of the property before we moved down and had the barn come out. Nice. That. So I have a friend in. It's, I for, I can't I don't even know if the I think this is northern India, very close to Pakistan, and I've sent this guy a bunch of spores, and uh, mm -hmm. he grows. Speaking of growing for his village, he grows for his village, and uh, it, electricity is so expensive there that he air conditions the one room that he grows in because it's like hot as balls there, right? It's like over a hundred degrees all, almost all the time, but he air conditions the one little room that he does his mushroom grow in. While the rest of his house, his wife included, they're just sweating balls all the uh, all the time. So no. you know that's funny. You got you got power in your barn, and then you got solar in your house. It made me made me see this barn is where we work in. This is what we've done. This is a forty two foot long by twenty six foot wide barn. It's a big barn, and this is where all our magic happens. Okay, now the that is mayhem will probably want to explain that that is we we do a lot of grain bags all at once obviously for our grows and for the ones that we sell and so this is the best way <laughs> for him yeah. to build the table and these 
each one of these little slats, it moves in and out. And so we can take that one and move that slat out over to the other table that we've got. And, and we can work and prep that. And then when we're done, put the empty slat back and pull the one in the middle out. And, you know, it's just, yep. that's part of just what we do. Replaceable tabletops. Nice. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And Mayhem built that. And, Very um, cool. Now, so when when you let those out to dry, um, I imagine so. Okay, you guys have a winter, right? Do you guys get snow where you're at? Oh yes, oh, yes. Yeah, We're supposed to get snow so that that's yeah. obviously indoors during the winter. I'm imagining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, it's in there. Yeah. It's so so fact. when when the weather's nice though, you're trying to get it out in the air, help it help it dry out a little bit. No, that was just because we were building on the inside and still needed to do production. So, oh, okay. No one sawdust or anything. Yep, I get it. No. Oh, hey, man, the mycelium might like sawdust. Who knows? You never Not, know. pine. Not the pine. Oh, no, pine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of my lab on, on the, uh, the green barn that you had up, my lab and spawn room are on the, the right of that. You, you're going to see how there's a small... Like it's like a it, the middle section's tall, and then you've got yeah. a little lean to on one side and a lean to on the other. Well, that lean to on the right side, that whole thing goes all the way back 26 feet. Now, my lab and our spawn room are connected together by two separate doors in there. He's okay. built a filled, um, I mean, a floor, and we've got the my lab walls are sealed off in plastic, and he's got HP, HEPA filters and stuff cool. in there. And the same with the spawn room, but we had to be able to control the temperatures and control them separately because my lab has to be a lot colder, obviously, than the spawn room. And then the middle area of that barn, like where you see the garage door, mm -hmm. that is where, yeah, see the garage door. That if you the garage door is not there, it's a window now, but at the time it was that middle area where it's higher is where he preps grain in the winter. That's where that, that that table is that you saw, and that's where the steam barrel cookers are and and where he does, yeah, see, all of that, that's what we do inside the barn in that middle area. Okay. And then on the right side of that would be um, our lab and our spawn room. But that's where, yeah, that's the spawn room. There's a spawn room, <laughs> yep. And I see you got... You got your your sheets of insulation in there. Try to try to bump oh, yeah, the, yeah. the temperatures a little bit. Yep, cool. All it's, right, so it's then let's insulated and then every we'll, little bit of insulation we can get in there. Yeah, yeah. every little R number. If you can get a <laughs> couple know, R here and there. Yep. When we when we're down there buying the barn, Kim didn't really have much input on anything, <laughs> so I let her pick colors. There you go. All right, she picked like the brown one. All right, so let's so we we see the barn, we we see a little bit of your pop cook, your popcorn operation. Now let's let's pull up some some of your creative uh, uh, ingenuity here. So it's looking like you made your own bubble barrels. Yeah, those are my passive uh, steam barrels. Uh, that right there is one of the inside barrels. It'll hold two hundred and fifty pounds of substrate each oh, barrel. Nice. Now. So so you're you're using steam, so it's it's not a pressure cooker. So I'm assuming that they're they're cooking in that steam for longer. How long are your runs? For my substrate, conar substrate, it's probably a, a once I hit temperature of 180, I, I cut it off. Okay. When I'm doing just conar. Okay, because gotcha. the insulation that I have around it under that foil insulation is that kill fiberglass like they use in yep. kills and stuff yep and it's like 2400 degrees so the temperature like really stays in that barrel okay. uh the next day 12 hours later it's maybe dropped to 160 i mean but the my for my conar uh it's just like basically a six hour deal okay getting cool. the steam up and going through there because uh, the steam barrels on the back are, are 55 gallons as well, and there's probably only about five gallons of water in there, so there's a lot of volume to fill up before right. any kind of heating takes place and stuff. So Gotcha. 
It can take an hour to get it up, up, just up to boil. Yeah, that's them. There's the whole system. I have two 55 gallon drums in the back feeding those four. Now, when I yep, do, I think I have a picture of that. Hold on, just so people can see. Yep. So those are your actual steam barrels. Yeah, those are my boilers. Yep. I use those as, as let's call them boilers. And, We're playing fast and loose with that word. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But now, okay. So first off, I'm just gonna go ahead. I was raised, we were pretty poor growing up. I mean, I was white poor, but we were poor. We we cleared lots in the summer because we heated with wood all winter. So every morning I got up, I was usually the first up and I would have to go get wood from the back if we didn't have it already in the basement. And I would have to, you know, feed the fire. So I'm looking there and you you literally, this is old school. You You got a literal fire going under these things. I love that. Well, I mean, propane's expensive. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it, it literally <laughs> takes a full tank to to do both barrels for the 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 lot amount of time, and and I got a lot of wood, dude. Yep. So I hear you. Fourteen acres. You're in the woods. Yeah, you're not yeah. gonna run out anytime soon. Yeah, I like it. All right, so you got so so again, so people understand that's outside the 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 barn. Yeah. Yes. He's like a boiler, right? The water's in there boiling. The steam yeah. coming off it's coming into these off a of manifold into these separate steamers. Correct. It's entering like through it. the top and leaves through the bottom. Now, um, there's a lot of there is some physics involved in this. Now, it, it's it's supposed to be an atmospheric pressure, but because of the vents that I have and the way we keep them partially closed and stuff like that and the amount of steam that's being made over the surface area of the the boiler you you are getting about two psi out of these oh, systems okay. nice um yeah and the, 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 the barrel can handle that no sweat i saw you had like a little ring band clamp on the top and so oh yeah the yeah. barrels can handle up to like six yeah. psi yep so i like it now, and that helps those that psi helps you out you're getting you know it, oh yeah, yeah. It takes thing. steam from two twelve to up to upwards of two twenty four, two twenty five. So uh, it's it's every little bit helps, and the insulation, the, the really thick insulation, helps to hold the heat in. Yep, I like that. Very cool. And then but so now the, here, here, here's here's right. You gotta gotta cook the grain to put it in the put it in the barrel. So. What do we got here? One, two, three, four, five, six. We got seven pressure cookers going. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I love, I do, I, a lot of people will hate me for this, but I do not like the All Americans, those big old All Americans. And my only complaint about them is A, the weight when they're full of corn, and B, you, you, when the propane, you, you don't get much cut back. Once you reach reach temperature, oh. I never got much cutback on that, you know, to, to, so I can conserve fuel and just right. keep it at that temperature. It was basically always at the same temperature it was to get it up to steam, and mm. I could never cut back. But these 23-quart Prestos, once I get them up to steam, I can cut those back oh, to yeah. where if it opens the door too hard, it'll blow out the flame. I hear you. So uh, yeah, when I get mine up to pressure, I can barely, you know, it, it's it's literally almost the lowest setting my burner can possibly be at. Yep, it right. Take much. They're, they're awesome. Uh, yep. I'd, I'd rather have a bunch of the, the the smaller lightweight ones than than some of those bigger ones. Now I like the space, but I have my barrel system if I wanted to do to do that. Right. Now, you asked me about the, my cook time on the wood blocks and stuff like that. I Cook those about, let's see, I start them early in the morning, and then I just cut it off at night. I mean, I quit as stoking it, yep. so they probably cook a good 18 hours, and I can reach up to 220 in there on the, I have a, a barbecue probe on the, okay. on the gauge, and I stick it in the middle of the bag um, to get that core temperature. I want to know what my core temperature is. And that's where I read it, and I just judge accordingly. Like, if I can't get that hot that day for some whatever reason, uh, it's usually because my float valve sort of sticks and I keep having cold water trickle in. That's usually the only reason that happens. Um, but 
other than that, I just watch the core temperature and, and, and cook accordingly. And, you know, nice. just stop stoking the fire. Now you can, you can stoke that fire to where it's really going and you can get some steam in there. Right. Pretty quick. I like it. Well, so I will, I'll say this. You're not the only person I've ever talked to who said they, you know, they, they fell for the marketing on all American. It just on every way, shape and form looked like this was the way to go. They got it. And then they go, you know what? I miss my 23 quart Presto. They're heavy. <laughs> oh, they're definitely heavy. And then a lot of people will buy them where they won't buy the, the electric, you know, all in one. And, and then, oh, yeah. then, then there's still a problem. So I tell everybody, you know, that 23 quart Presto for, you know, get the induction burner bottom on it. That one's going to take care of you. It's, it, it's a nice little machine, you know, unless you're trying to spend three to five grand on an autoclave, you're, you're, you're good. Right. I mean, I'm two, three years into this. I still use a 23 quart Presto. I'm, I'm not mad at it. I'm never sitting around going, man, I just need to get something else. This is not working. That's like the most foolproof part of my whole process. It, it it works great, so yeah. For so for all the the newbies watching, people that are just getting into it, um, you know, if you are thinking about buying your first twenty three quart Presto, if you just bought it and you're already going, oh, I need an all American, I need an autoclave, I need a this, I need a that. Just chill out. You 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 might not. Yeah. <laughs> you might not. What? <laughs> all right. So you guys sent us some fruit picks too. Let, let's take a look at some of the fruits of your labor. Um, here we go. All right. All right. So what do okay. we got here? This is AMAC. Okay. Um, and it's grown on our all-in-ones that we make. Okay. And um, what I did was I just let it fully colonize. And when I was ready to put it into fruiting, I put it in the bottom of a mono tub on top of some hydrated perlite, you know, and on top of a liner. And Set it there. Then just set it there, and you know, every you know, I will. I like to take my totes on a daily basis in front of my flow hood, pop the lid, fan it for about a minute, let the CO2 out, and then close it, you know, especially on these. And this is AMAC. Um, this is I got I can't remember if it was a spore or Dave likes to send those little, I think it's two cc centrifuges. Too. things with transfers in it. I, he sent me a bunch of those, a few of his plates and some swabs and it's, it's his genetics. And then I grew him on plates and isolated it. And, and this is our LC. This is the product of our LC on our all in ones. And it's grown this particular way in a monotub. I've actually grown three different ways on the all in ones just to, to test the versatility of them. Right. Now, I'll tell you one thing I like about this setup is like you're just talking about, you know, getting rid of your CO2. You don't want to sit on the cake when you're in fruiting. The great thing about this setup is you have a moat around your block. So, right, CO2 is heavier. So most yep. of your CO2 is going to be below the layer of that cake automatically just by how you got that set up. Yes. It's, it, it, that's... And this is why, right, PF Tech works real well for a bunch of reasons, but that's also one of the reasons is you just got a thing sitting up in a tub and you got room for that CO2 to go somewhere. Yep. Just like, and, yeah, here, people can see better kind of what I'm talking about by seeing this photo. Yeah. Yep. See, this is an interesting, I put this up because this is how versatile this is. Okay, this is Albino B Plus that we have on LC. And this is again an all-in-one, and I had I, I just got a big long mono tub and actually put three blocks next to each other right. on a liner on that so that and and then modify you know I've got the little gas exchange holes. Yep. But um, <clears throat> yes, I uh, same thing. We shook it up, let it colonize, and then when it was time to fruit, we just put them in there and shook them out of the bag and laid them right. on top of a liner on top of the perlite for humidity. And, and so your, your perlite, this reminds me of uh, my buddy Ed Grand. He's doing this thing called, he calls it diaper tech. Somebody came up with, they thought this was a cute way of calling it. But what they use is they use a chucks pad. So it's like, uh, you know, an incontinence pad that you might use for grandma because she, she craps herself at night, right? So 
what he does, he sets these down on his shelves and then he just pours water until they're full of water. And, and then you're setting your blocks on there or you're, or you're setting your tub in there. So it's very similar, but this works really well. This idea, you could also have a, a Martha tent that just had a bunch of vessels of water. Well, any, see. any way you can humidify that air is, is really good. Now the perlite's wonderful. Um, and, and you just got that, assuming you don't get any contamination, you just keep hydrating that perlite and that can just be a little machine for you. Just keep throwing your, your, your blocks in there. It's awesome. See, that's we we ran out of room to send you pictures, but we also we the way we usually grow in the summer and the spring weather permitting on the other side of that building is we have an auto, fully automated grow chamber, mm -hmm. open air. And so the other way I didn't get to show you. Oh, yeah, I do have one picture of it in the open air chamber. No, that's shred. OK, this is the all in one. And we basically mix it up. And instead of letting it sit there and fully colonize, we poured it and planted it in a liner in a monotub. Uh, okay. That's a different way that you can use the all-in-one. Say you don't want a big block. Those are the all-in-ones. <laughs> yep. yep. And see, we, we already did something different with these. In case you haven't noticed, the other all-in-ones have the substrate on the top and the grain on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And after watching mycelium grow so often on these grain bags and stuff and watching these, it grows, it, you know, it's going to grow downward. And the easiest thing that we, well, I think there's one that I sent you that was fully colonized, if you have that picture. Yes. See, what we do is we inoculate, and that's another thing. We do not have injection ports. We're, because... Honestly, time, it's right. yeah, we don't like them. It's a waste of time. It's a waste yeah. of money. And where we've seen them, people are putting them right in the middle of the grain. And so you squirt the juice right in the middle. You take a chance of, you know, piercing the grain as you're shooting it. So we always go above the grain level and shoot downward across the grain with our with our LC. OK. And so yeah. as the mycelium is colonizing, after it gets about 50 percent on there we just i've got a video up that shows this but you 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 just mix the grain up a little bit so that that part it's you know the reshaking of the bag don't shake yeah. the whole thing just that that part when the grain colonizes halfway you just shake that just a little bit with your fingers you know just gently don't disturb the bottom and then when it recolonizes and it starts to look like that picture and it goes down. Yeah. I'm sorry, my hands in the way. <laughs> oh no, that's um, fine. That bag's ready. Now you can either shit. What you can do is you take that elastic off. Yeah. And um, and the reason why we've got that fabric elastic is because that's the only thing that we found so far cheaply that we can use to keep it separated in the pressure cooker so it doesn't melt. Okay. <laughs> so it's cloth. But anyway, you take that whole thing off and you you either, if you want to just mix it up and plant it in a tote on top of a liner, you can do that and let it colonize by itself. Mm -hmm. Or you can take take that, shake it up, mix it up in the bag, let it recolonize. And you can either cut it at the top and burp it every now and then and just leave everything in the bag and grow it straight up in the bag. or you can also let it block up like what we showed you in those pictures and put it on the liner in the tote on top of the perlite. There are many ways you can do this. Yep. And, and, and I've shown you three different results of three different ways. So, yeah, this and is great. And this is great for people who maybe they don't have a clean environment. You're getting to do that full cake colonization in the bag you know, just the one time that you got to inoculate. And other than that, it's a sterile environment. It gets to grow. And, you know, most of us who've grown mushrooms know, but for, for any newbies watching, once you have that full cake colonized, it's a whole lot more resistant to contamination. Now, yes, it is. The, the newbies go, well, but I've seen trike and, and, you know, what about trichoderma and all that? Well, it was there before. It was there in your colonization process. But yeah, if you have a healthy cake, 
it, it, it's a lot more resistant to contamination. So you guys are solving a huge problem for a lot of newbies by giving them a process where it stays in the bag, it stays sterile. You know, we did that for you guys. Now all you got to do is knock it up with a little liquid culture and and, and you're good to go. It's, it's, yeah. uh, I, I've become a big fan of the all-in-ones because <laughs> man, when people start coming into this community fast and furious, you cannot hard sell everybody on becoming like an obsessed cultivator like we all are. The right, first step yeah. just needs to be, we're going to show you how to easily grow mushrooms by, by one of my all-in-one grow bags, by an LC, you're growing some mushrooms. Let and them tell you they them. want to get obsessed. And then you can go, well, yeah. cool. Now you're one of us. Now, now we can talk, you know, we, we, we can go as far down the rabbit hole as you want to go. But yeah, these are great for people who are just, they don't know yet how, how far they're trying to go. Yes, and we would see, Ooh. okay, there it is. That's the grow chamber. That's an all-in-one. Uh, that's our all-in-one. Again, that's AMAC. And that is that was in our open grow chamber that we have, yeah. and that's on the other side of the barn. Now, that's just our mail mag. We grew that in, actually, we grew that in our open air chamber. That's our OG mail mag. Big fruits. I love them. There it is. That guy was, he was almost a, that is our albino Avery that we have. Yeah. Yep. All of these fruits that you see, we have grown from our own LC, which is exactly what we nice. put out for the public. So yeah, that was gorgeous. Yep. Those are albino Avery also, actually. Those are in our open air air chamber that we you know it's a it's more than a big Martha tin. It's the left side of the barn that you see on the other side of the door. And he is completely walled it up, completely insulated. It's sealed it up. He's got HEPA filters, an automated humidity system, and a mister in there. The whole bottom, right. which is 26 foot long and, and 12 foot wide, it has like four inches of perlite on it. And we've got stepping stones <laughs> oh wow! Very cool. So yeah, that's where we you grow. Get, all our... You get to walk into your monotub. Yes, 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 yes we do. Yeah. And boy, I love the way it feels. We've had a few visitors that are from our group. Nice. And and they've been over here and they've actually walked in there and seen, you know. And so it's. And it's, contamination isn't really an issue like you think it is. It's. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, you 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 want to kind of wear a mask and. Obviously, don't get up on them and 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 breathe or touch everything unless there's a purpose. Right. And you know, we like I like to spray. I like to Lysol down right before I walk in the door, and especially our shoes. But they're stepping stones. I don't. And no, man, he's. Yeah. It's not, you know, and 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 another thing about that is we don't have outbreaks. Okay, I I call it a trained eye or whatever, but I can look at something and be like. Okay, this is about to have trike. And, and oh, I'll go. Yeah. Over, oh, you know, this is what I tell it. everybody is guys, just start growing <laughs> mushrooms because there are things I can't teach you. You're going to just have to experience it. But for sure, I mean, same with your jars. Like, uh, yeah, you know, you know, I got 10 good. jars going right now. I got one that I know is bad just yeah. because of how it's growing. I'm going to let it go yeah. and make sure. But. Right, you just you start getting an eye for it, and you're just like, that, yeah, I gotta get rid of that. You know, and so we always catch it, you know, and I'll keep my eye on it, and and, and as soon as it, I can tell it's about to, we're like, all right, this might as well go, yeah. or I'll yeah. isolate it in another area. One of my main things is I like to put a dome on it and put it outside underneath our solar panel, you know, and just yeah. see what it does. But I am, it'll do something. It'll it probably will. do something. Yeah. Yeah. It will. Mm -hmm. It will. But I mean, I am constantly monitoring everything as far as when we're in production yeah. you know and that's one of the things is because i want to keep that eye out for that phenotype i want you know I've, we have we, we put lc out there to the public so i gotta make sure you know i'm I'm on top of everything yeah. so because that's what we do all day long you know it's not like okay i've got to go out here to no, this is what we do. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's important to us because this yeah. is somebody's medicine. Yes. And if they come and they're always buying golden yeah. teacher from us, they deserve to get the same golden teacher every time. You know. You know, it's yeah. just. It, you know, now standards for ourselves and everything is one thing. 
but we have to keep our standards a lot higher and stay on top of everything simply because we do have a lot of people that are depending on our product for their medicine and for their growth. Yes. So we can't fuck it up. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So I, let me pull up. Speaking of that, uh, let, let's pull up a few more of these pictures might speak to that a little bit. All right. So That's what do we got here? Plus. They get really, really massive. That is a very aggressive LC that we have. I highly recommend casing it. Okay. And um, because they, 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 there's so much, you got to space it out, give it a chance to do its own thing, honestly. Right. And it'll hold moisture very well. There they are grown in a, uh, that's a tub that I brought in that I was ready to harvest. Nice. This is MB. Okay. This is Mel Mac Benhike. That was actually grown in Michigan in an operation we set up for a private company. Um, and that's, that's the, that's the there's the grow chamber mayhem built for that private company. That is one third of the size of it. I am up halfway and it goes all the way to the back and it goes all the way over another 14 feet. There's an aisle in the middle and there's an aisle on the other side of the wall, just like that. Nice. There we go. Mayhem. <laughs> yep. That was one of the things we did in Ann Arbor, Detroit. Very cool. Those are the Yeti I do there. That's that's my little Yeti isolation. That's the Enigma. Definitely a little bit of psilocybin in there. You can tell. Yeah. <laughs> I have fun growing Enigma. That's oh, one of my fun. That's the Lucid Gates. That's my one of our really good friends. We've spent a lot of time with him. He's come out here. Is Silo Vibin. Great, great buddy of ours. Um, yeah. Very private guy as well. Family man. And he... um. He sent me these, he sent me some plates of this Lucid Gates and um, his were already, you know, he'd already been growing it and stuff. And I, I'm like, well, this is a good looking plate. So I started doing my own sectors and I got me a pretty oscillation. I got a real pretty plate and turned it into LC and boom, there it is. Yep. So these, I, I'm loving these Lucid Gates we grew and they were so fun to grow. When they first started coming up in the tubs, it looked like I don't know, dead. Mm -hmm. There they are again. I've got a couple pictures of them. They started looking like little dead fingers sticking up out of the ground. And I'm like, well, this ain't going to work. I've done something wrong. You know, I thought I was going to have to go back and redo it. And I just nope, let them just keep wait going. a minute. Yep. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, boom, here they come. Something I noticed when they first started coming up, the little caps were like little pin dots. They small. So I started giving them a lot of FAE. Mm -hmm. I would take them in front of the, I took the toast and I would put it in front of the hood and um, fan the CO2 and stuff really well. But I had a timer and I'd actually sit there and fan it for a minute straight. And then I put it back, you know, and that doesn't mean that's the only way you can do it. But for me, I discovered that was a way to get the caps to look bigger. <laughs> cool. So, you know, and, and so, but these were incredible. Once they started growing, my God, I would go out there the next day to see, you know, oh, let's see how the babies are. And hell, they've grown an inch and a half to an, two inches overnight. Right. It, it was amazing. Some of these got up to 13 inches long. Yeah, they're Beautiful. not small. Do you, yeah, yeah, man. I, so, you know, these are the creation of James Cruz. Shout out to James Cruz. These are, I mean, these are one of the great cultigens available right now, in my opinion. It's it's a really vigorous, really attractive fruit, uh, fantastic potency. Yep. Yeah, it's really cool. It, it It's like an improved Yeti as far as uh, kind of how I would describe it. It's bigger. That's what I was going to ask you. The oranges, okay. Now, James, isn't this something from, now there's Lucid Gates, there's Emerald Gates, there's Pearly Gates. And all of that, that's... They all they all came from, from uh, Pearly Gates originally, yeah. Now, isn't that all from the TAM project? Man, now I, I don't want to... I don't know. I'm not going to say. I This it's is my... So hard to yeah. keep up with it. I don't ever know. I hear so much. I just know, me personally, I got the genetics from Silo. Now, I'm right. sure he wasn't the creator. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm still, there's so much out there to learn, you know, as yeah. far as who created what and everything. And that's why I just stick to the basics, especially with what the LCs I make, you know, I know, like, you know, 
man, I, I don't want to quote. I don't know the very specifics. I, I just know that all his Gates stuff, you know, the the name Gates is an homage to Pearly Gates. Um, that that's Michael Mc, Montgomery, who uh, hopefully we'll have him on soon. I've 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 extended the offer a couple times, and and one of these days we'll get him on. It'll be great to to hear about that cultigen. Um, but yeah, man, I I, I love Lucid Gates. Uh, that. I love those gnarled stipes, you know, the real bumpy stipes towards the cap. They, they look so cool. Um, all right, guys, we're hitting about, you know, not quite the two hour mark. I, I And we've covered everything that I was hoping to, to get through. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just say thank you so much for being on. Um, I know it's a little trickier being out in the boondocks, you, you, you know, getting the Internet to work and all that stuff. So I uh, really appreciate the effort. And uh, it was great hearing, I mean, just some some really amazing stories. I'm going to tell you, the Ensenada story is probably <laughs> one of my favorites I've, I've heard to date. You know, I'm waiting. I'm going to put it out there, guys. Uh, if somebody's got an old waterbed sitting in in, in storage, um, you know, yeah. let's let's see some photos. Let's make it happen. Oh, man, I would love to do that again. I, that whole yeah. project all over again. Yeah, yeah that with, would be so cool. It, there's got to be one around here on marketplace or something somewhere. Somebody's got one or in a basement or in, you know, there's, I mean, they really have vanished, but, but somebody has got to have one out there somewhere that they could. Now the trick is that you get the, the bladder that's not leaky. Cause I remember that was like, everybody had a water bed until the bladder leaked and then they got rid of the water bed. Right? Yeah. Right. One mistake. And then, then dad would be like, get this thing out of here. This is, you know, they had to replace drywall, all that good stuff. So, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Much love. All right, guys. That was Kimberly King and her man, Mayhem. They are rocking and rolling in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee, up in the mountains. Um, I, uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but, man, that, that waterbed story... Oh my God, that was just cool, just as a cultivator, but also extremely cool to hear about that history, right? To hear like, man, even when uh, Terrence and Dennis McKenna, you, you know, kind of put it all on the radar for us, Mar Maria Sabina, um, you know, Gordon Wasson, all these guys that sort of elevated the awareness, um, it had been going on forever before that. And without any of us, uh, you know, European people, coming in and doing what we always do, uh, there was just an organic and very sacred connection to these mushrooms in many indigenous peoples for hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of years, which uh, I just, I mean, I can tell you, I get it. I understand why. If I imagine being some caveman back in the day and I stumbled upon the stuff in the woods, one day I'm really hungry. I give it a try. Next thing you know, mine, just like life changing. You guys know it. If if you've experienced it, you already know what I'm talking about. So anyway, I, I just thought that story was phenomenal. I loved their perspective. I loved how passionate they are. I love how, right, they, they this is their day to day, but then also this isn't like, corporate takeover day to day. This is just like some people who this is how they want to make their living. I, I deeply respect that. I love that. And uh, if you guys are interested in checking out any of their liquid culture or their grain bags, um, all that information will be in the description below. All right, guys, I just want to mention next week, um, I got a very special episode coming up. Um, it is a continuation of the HPLC episode that I had uh, very early on in the show that, that's called Silo Chemist. That was with George Selhorn of Flourish Labs and Jordan Jacobs of Trip Labs. Um, th this is a continuation and, and evolution of uh, that content. So uh, we will be sitting down with George Selhorn of Flourish Labs. We will also be sitting down with Ian Bollinger um, of the Center for uh, Mycoanalytics. And we'll be sitting down with Caleb King uh, of Triptomics. I got a chance to hang out with Caleb's uh, business partner, uh, Chris Pauly, uh, in Mexico this past summer. He's a phenomenal guy, and uh, I can tell you right now, Caleb is is also a, a very cool guy. 
So these guys are have have been grinding it out in the HPLC space for for mushrooms for a while now, and they have a lot to talk about. It for me was a profound, very significant uh, recording, and I cannot wait to get this out to you guys so you can can have a listen and start to further contextualize the way in which HPLC can shape and play a positive and hopefully not, but potentially negative role in, in what we're doing. So anybody that's taken this seriously enough to, to want to, you know, get their dosing right, develop a product or, or around mushrooms, they should absolutely be tuning into this episode. It is phenomenal. Uh, so until next week, go grow some mushrooms. Mm -hmm.